this theme comes from reading the Sunday readings of last Sunday. You know, I was praying in the Sunday readings. Sunday, I saw my God, there's a beautiful revelation hidden in those readings. And I thought, I must share it with everyone. So the theme is a question. Do we need others? That's the question. I, do we need others to know to know God and to walk with God. Do we need others? Or can't we do it by ourselves? So why I'm asking this question is uh, ministering to people now, doing 40 years of ministering, I'm seeing a, a tremendous shift in the thinking patterns of people over the last decades. What is that? We are living in a world of independence and individualism. You know. The more stronger the culture and the, the, the countries and are getting and the economies are getting and people are becoming richer or, or are able to meet their needs, uh, people are becoming independent and individualistic. So first of all, there is financial independence. Because everyone wants to be financially independent. So the emancipation of, uh, of women in the world is seen by the financial independence. You know? You know? So if you become financially independent, you can tell anyone to go do whatever they like because you can live your own life. So everyone wants to be financially independent. But not only fried. There is a f need for people to be free of commitment. Isn't that amazing? You know? Now, those days, when somebody joined a firm, say it was Unilever or, or whatever the firm, uh, generally it was uh, seen that they would live their entire life there. 20 years, 30 years, the railway, <laughs> the, the police, <laughs> whatever, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, but today, uh, it's like this. Three years I'm here. <laughs> Two years I'm there, then my position is okay. Now five, four years I'll be here. So they are working in that company, but they are not actually committed. They are on their way. <laughs> they, are, they, they are on their way to the top. And on their way, they have landed here. <laughs> so while we are here, we'll do some stuff. Okay, I'll help you. You pay me, but I'm on my way. There is no commitment. But except in Japan, you know, if you look at the Japanese system, it's different because in Japan uh, you have a commitment to your to your organization, which is uh, coming from their culture. And if you notice, where do you find the best products in the world? You get it in Japan <laughs> because they are not cheating, stealing, <laughs> shortcuts, quality. You know, companies like Toyota, uh, you know, uh, world leaders, not by accident because of the quality that they produce consistently because they have a family uh, approach. And you can see here, today that approach is largely gone. What is that? Commitment is to yourself. So you walk through your jobs. But the sad thing is, it has come to marriage also now. It has come to relationships. So now, for, you know, marriage if you have to, relationship if you must, <laughs> then that also, the commitment is to yourself. Let's see whether we are beneficial to each other. If not, we walk away. <laughs> because it's the cultural approach now. What is the, where you want to be independent. Actually, I found when we, we traveled over the last decade, you know, in developed countries we found. Sometimes the government has to protect children from their parents. <laughs> it's amazing. You can see it. the government has to protect children from their parents. Why is that? Parents not matured, not ready to look after children. So therefore, they have a hotline. They have instruction for kindergarten and children. If your parents <laughs> are be doing something, call the hotline. And then they protect the children from their parents. 
because they have been raised, their parents have been raised with this idea. It's about yourself. Saw this chilling news account in France. A couple came to the to the car sale, which is a beautiful racing car, and they said, uh, "Can we trade our infant for this vehicle?" They thought he was joking. They thought they were joking, but they were not joking. <laughs> they were serious. <laughs> and you would see, why does this happen? Because there is this tremendous problem of individualism. People who have the perception you can live for yourself by yourself. And you can use everybody else to do it. But you know what the sad thing is? Spirituality has come to that. So now we have religion. <laughs> we have preachers. We have a spirituality which tells you, you can walk with God by yourself. You have your God, you have a personal relationship with him, and whatever you don't like about that God, you let, you let it go. And believe in the stuff that you like. And then you walk in with that God. And that's what's happened to many people. So there are, there are deviations in Christianity. You know, there was this, there was this uh, charismatic leader in the, in, uh, in the U.S., you know. And uh, he, he built Christianity. It was a Christian movement. But then he said, I am the personification of Jesus Christ, you know. And then he got his disciples to drink poison. Why is that? Because it was their interpretation of Christianity. So the question I'm asking, I'm just thinking tonight is, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of religion do you have in your heart? You know, what, kind of, what kind of value does has been placed in? Can you walk by yourself? Can you walk with God without anybody else? And will it really answer the need of your life? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the first reading is taken from the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel 3, 3. So I want to tell you something about the background to this. 1 Samuel 3, 3. You know that everyone knows about Samuel. You know. So uh, before, before I talk about Samuel, I want to talk about his mother. You know. Samuel's mother had a big problem. The problem was that she didn't have a child. It became even worse because the husband took another, another uh, wife. You know. And not having children was a great pain for her. And then she went and prayed to God, Oh God, don't put me to shame. Let me have children. You know. And it is said that she went to the temple and she was praying, asking God, pleading with God uh, for a child. And she was praying audibly. And Eli, the priest, saw this and thought she was drunk. And what did she do? What did Eli do? Came and said, wife, why are you staying here if you are drunk? He said, no, I'm not drunk. I'm pleading with God for a child. And then he, she told Eli, if I have a child who will take away my shame, I will give him to God. So God was working in the life of Samuel before Samuel was born. But let, listen carefully. But he was working in not answering a prayer. <laughs> and you need to understand that. When God didn't answer the prayer of Samuel's mother, God was working. Someone can ask, how can that happen? You know, that happened because I'm just asking. If if this mother had children whenever she wanted, and she had five of them, would she have offered them to God? What do you think? I don't think. 
you do this job, you do that job, you do the other job, and you offer them to, to you get them to do their job. But why did she offer him to God? Because of the crisis in her life. So my brothers and sisters, if God is not answering you, he may be doing something that you don't know, understand yet. And if, and all we can do is surrender to him in that crisis. As long as you ask, why, 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 we are stuck. And tonight I want to offer you this first hope. In all unanswered situations, God is at work. So we may never think, we are thinking God starts working when the problem question is answered. No, he's working when there's no answer. And he was preparing Samuel, one of the greatest, greatest men that God raised. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So you can see, now Samuel is now given to God in the temple. And here comes the story now, the background. You, know. you, can, you can repeat after me. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. So he was now, he was given to Eli and Eli, he was working as for Eli like a servant, you know, while being trained for the work of God. And now he's sleeping where the ark of the covenant is, you know. Uh, see what happens, verse 4. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. Okay, verse 5. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You call me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Do you know what is happening? This boy is serving in the temple, but he has never heard the voice of God. Can it happen to us? We have been going to church all our life, <laughs> saying our prayers, but we may have never heard the voice of God in our lives. So our, our God relationship with God is essentially a third party thing, <laughs> you know. Somebody said, that happened. This one said it. This is the meaning of these words. It's a third party thing. And you can be a serving God and you have never heard his voice. And if that is so, tonight is a good day to begin this journey of, of dear Lord, I want to hear you speak. And, he, and it's the right of every single Christian you must hear his voice. Not the voice of somebody else telling you what the Lord said. You, of course, you need that. But you need to hear that voice. And Samuel didn't. Maybe we never heard it. Verse 6. Again the Lord called. Samuel, Sa Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You call me. My son, Eli said. I did not call. Go back and lie down. <laughs> you know, it's like playing hide and seek. <laughs> God also must have been doing a joke. <laughs> He's calling this guy. He's running to somebody else. You know. I remember when cell phones were new, you know. And it was the time when everyone, so it was a unique thing. So at that time we were having a press, you know, and there was this old gentleman who had just bought a cell phone, you know, and he came, and he sat there to work, you know, and there was this young guy, you know, he used to do, come for printing work, you know, he was pretty naughty, you know. He realized that this guy was now new with the cell phone. So he found out his number and sat next to him and he dialed him. <laughs> 
and now the moment the phone rang this guy ran out of the office to answer and he went on the road because he didn't want answer you know? he he got him to run about 10 times outside because megas you know this guy ho- hoping for a call but he cuts in the same way i think yeah, same thing is happening you know god is calling eli uh, the god is calling samuel but he's getting the wrong number <laughs> is hard sorry somebody else okay verse seven. now samuel did not yet know the lord can you see that you keep us serving god but he did not know him the word of the lord you can repeat that had not yet been revealed to him can you see that not yet been so my brother my sister you can study the word without it being revealed into your heart and that's when we get stuck and here is the beautiful uh, revelation each of us needs to hear him and to this week we may be the beginning of really really wanting to hear his voice and look at verse 8 beautifully given to us the lord called samuel a third time and samuel got up and went to eli and said here i am you call me then eli realized that the lord was call, calling the boy can you see now somebody else realized what god was doing in this person's life was nine So Eli told Samuel go and lie down and if he calls you say speak lord for your servant is listening so Samuel went and lay down in his place now can you see you need someone to lead you to god that's why we have a church that's why we have a community you need god you need to be introduced to god god works through people someone can turn around and tell me you know what about saint paul you know god came directly into his life of course but see what happened next he was led to the people and it was this lowly ananias who actually brought the baptism of the holy spirit into the life of paul and you look at verse 10 yes the lord came and stood there calling as at other times samuel samuel then samuel said speak for your servant is listening praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord can you see now introduced to the lord by another and the beautiful thing completes with verse 19 the church offices was 19 as the concluding verse this verse 10 verse 19 and it says here the lord was with samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground now can you see now samuel personally knew the lord so i think we need to look at our own life and find out did we have a eli in our life did we have a mother who prayed and i think about it you know in my own life i suddenly realize you know my mother was praying for me desperately because i had lost my faith I had gone into so many addictions and my life was a mess and she used to keep on praying you know and then i remember it was a nun who really became eli for me bringing god into my life but once i received him God gave me the grace to walk with him independently to start hearing his voice to know his love and walk with him and here is the whole process somebody prays for you somebody else becomes Eli 
and then you start walking with God. Everyone must walk personally with God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So otherwise what happens is the, at, in the church we are Christian. In the prayer meeting we are holy and praise and worshippers. Among friends we become heathens. <laughs> so we are, we are caught up in, a, in this whole system you know, where we don't personally walk with God. And tonight I'm just ask, inviting you, let's find that place in our life. It's number one. And we go to the gospel, we find Eli there, we find God there, and we find Samuel also. It's amazing, you know, how Eli, God, and Samuel are all three there in the New Testament. You know, let's show. John chapter 1, verse 35. Now here's John the Baptist. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. So John was hanging out. You know. Two of his disciples were there around him and you know they were admiring him and he was hanging out. Verse 36. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Can you see now? He pointed to Jesus. Eli pointed to God. Who is Eli here? John the Baptist. Who is God? Jesus, who is the word of God. Now can you see, John is introducing his disciples to Jesus. He is not keeping them for himself. Look at verse 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. My God, John lost two disciples. <laughs> Can you see now what John's purpose, what was his purpose? Introduce them to Jesus. What is our purpose? Introduce people to Jesus. To do what? That they may walk with him. Not to keep them for ourselves. Introduce them to Jesus. Then they walk with him. And look at verse 38. Beautifully explains. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? <laughs> They want to find out what he's doing. Where are you staying? Verse 39. Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. <laughs> now we haven't been introduced to Samuel yet. Now these two disciples only came, you know. Now, can you see? Now, Samuel is coming now. Verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Now, we are introduced to Andrew and verse 41. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you see now? Now we are coming. Now we have Samuel. <laughs> Introduced by whom? By the two others whom, who, were, who met the Lord. And verse 42 completes it. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. That means you will be the rock. Here we made Samuel now. Can you see the beautiful flow of God's ways? One knows the Lord, introduces him to the other, but then the other person also must know the Lord. 
and God's plan for each one becomes released. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You call it from moving from dependence to independence. So my brothers and sisters, dependence means, you know, I've seen this in our own lives, in our own ministry. People see nothing wrong with you. Why is that? Because I, I'm a preacher. I, I share the word. I pray for people. Uh, everything is good. And everyone follows because of that. Wow, that's a beautiful meeting. That's a beautiful sermon. That's a beautiful prayer. You know, And everyone starts worshipping Jesus, praising the Lord, wanting to be disciples because of their relationship with me. And that's fine. But then after some time, they really want to get close, you know. And when they get close, uh, we, they start having issues. Why is that? Because I'm not Jesus, you're not Jesus. No one is Jesus. And when the weaknesses come out, or a sudden reaction bursts out, or some kind of brokenness is revealed, the very person who introduced you to Christ becomes the one who becomes the obstacle to walk with him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm not coming anymore. <laughs> I'm not walking by. They are all hypocrites. <laughs> so, so one, one person was not coming to church. You know. So the priest went to see because why he was not coming. You know. And went and asked, why aren't you coming? I uh, said, all those people in the church are hypocrites. You know. And the priest said, uh, don't worry, you can join us because there's always room for one more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you can see that the problem is the first step was right. But there was another step. Independence is a good place. But independence will only achieve little in life. Today a lot of people are individualistic. They have come to financial independence, mental, intellectual independence, freedom to, to live their own life. That's fine. But that's not the complete answer. The complete answer lies in something called interdependence. Where we are brought together to do something bigger than ourselves or to be something bigger than ourselves. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it's brought out beautifully. It's brought out beautifully in the epistle that we have of this last Sunday. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 6, 30. St. Paul is talking to the Corinthians. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will destroy both. <laughs> you know, you can, if you read the whole context, that means they were coming to the, to the celebration of the, of the meeting and they were eating like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and he was getting so angry. You know, they come to eat, you know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but God will destroy them both, he said. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. You can repeat that. But for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. My brother, my sister, I want you to understand this clearly. St. Paul is giving us another dimension. You know, in the Old Testament, people heard the voice of God and they followed him as disciples. But in the New Testament, it is more. We are not just hearing the voice of Jesus and following him because John the Baptist was the same. They heard his voice and they followed him. There's something more here. What is the more? Verse 14. If you look at verse 14, it's given to us beautifully. By his power... God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. In other words, there is an element called divine life now working inside us when you accept Jesus. People have forgotten this. 
We have gone to the philosophy of Christ. We have gone to the theology of Christ. We have gone to the principles of Christ. We have gone to the ethics of Christ. We have gone to the values of Christ. But we have forgotten that there is a divine element the moment you accept Christ into your life. So like the vaccine, everyone is talking about the vaccine. You know. And what happens when you receive the vaccine? You receive a, an element that will resist the evil of that, of that disease that is coming to us through the virus. So there is a divine element coming in through Jesus Christ. It is not simply following the principles of Christ. And we have forgotten this. Something more. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Isn't that shocking? That I am a part of Jesus Christ. You know, you know in baptism, you know, I heard Bishop Barron say that we become part of the Holy Trinity. You know. I thought to myself, you know, I dare not say that in my public sermon, you know, how do you become part of the Holy Trinity? Then I checked the the catechism of the Catholic Church. That's exactly what it says. In other words, when you Accept Jesus into your life. You simply are not following him. You become a part of him. You become a part of him. And his life is flowing through us. See how St. Paul explains it. Because they were having a problem in Corinth. Shall I then take the members of Christ? You can repeat that. And unite them with a prostitute? Never. Can you see? St. Paul is telling these people, you know, they had these temple prostitutes. That's why we don't have the cultural understanding. In Corinth, they had these temple prostitutes. One of their religious rituals was having sexual relationship with temple prostitutes. And they were used to that. And they brought that thinking here. And St. Paul is saying, you can't do that. Because the moment you took Christ into your life, you became a part of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And he confirms it. Verse, verse uh, 17. If you look at verse 17. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Isn't that amazing? You become one with him in spirit. My brother, my sister, I was just thinking, you know, when you get, when you have been introduced to Christ through people and you are walking your discipleship in the church or in the community, uh, we can be tempted to think that our responsibility is to the church and to the community only. So when that happens, we can, if I can hide something from the community or from the church and do it quietly, it's okay because I'm, I'm avoiding the problem. But we don't realize this has eternal ramifications. Eternal ramifications because we are dealing with eternity and God and Jesus Christ alive. And if we are fooling around, we are actually fooling around with him. And the results are eternal. It's not just for this tomorrow or day after, you know. Uh, if if so and so finds out, I'll get a blasting, you know. It's not about that. We are too. We are got caught up in this little world. We got caught up in this little world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And here it is. We are part of Jesus Christ. But you must remember, if you go back to verse 15, if you go back. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? The, what does that mean? That means every disciple of Jesus Christ is related to one another. Every disciple of Jesus Christ is a part of, part of one another. And God, when the man is moving by the Holy Spirit, he is moving Together with everybody. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. So my brothers and sisters, when we become a part of this great move of God, God working together with everybody else, our little life, God uses to do great things that you can't imagine. That's the power of, his, of what he wants to do. That's why we have to become from dependence. We, somebody has to introduce us to Christ. Then we have to become independent. We have to walk personally with Christ, never mind what others do. Then we have to become interdependent. That's when I complement the weakness of another. That person is weak, but my strength will balance that. I am weak. His or her strength will balance that. And because of that, we grow together into the nature of Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Working together, led by the Holy Spirit. This is our call. That's the meaning of the church. That's the meaning of the community. Introduced to the Lord by somebody. Growing into independence. I walk personally with God. And I'm responsible to God. Never mind what happens. Then God calls me to work together. We are one body. And I carry the woundedness of one. And they carry my woundedness. Suddenly we have supernatural life flowing through us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So tonight, I want to offer you a, a beautiful example from the life of St. Francis to illustrate this. Actually, St. Francis was a man who had a deep personal encounter uh, with Jesus Christ. Many people today tell us, after Jesus Christ, the greatest impact on the church has been St. Francis of Assisi. And, and for us, too good to remember, he was a layman. He lived a layman. He died a layman. In fact, uh, he never had any permission to preach, you know. <laughs> and that's why he went to the Pope. Uh, when somebody said, you can't preach, you're a layman, he went to the Pope to ask permission. You know? And the Pope received a dream from God and uh, gave him permission. But the beautiful thing is, St. Francis deeply wanted to follow Jesus. That's all he wanted to do. And this inspired others to join him. Actually, they say that in his lifetime, there were 10,000 friars in his order. I don't know what they fried, but... <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 10, uh, in, the, in, the, in his order. You know. And this story I'm trying to tell you is about a record given by one of the brothers who wrote about his life. They were, in the, they were spending the winter in a hut and uh, there was snow had fallen and there was no travelers on the road. And there were three rogues or thieves and they used to waylay people on the road and that's how they lived, you know. But now they had no one. So what do you, what do, you do? They were hungry. And they came to the hut where St. Francis was with two or three other brothers. They were spending the winter there. And they came and knocked on the door and asked for food. Can you please give us food? So that brother recognized who these people were. And said, you rogues, he said. Hi, we know who you are. You waylay people. Now you don't have anyone to rob. Now you come to ask for food. Get out from here. Chase them. And then Francis was inside. Francis asked, what's the, what's the noise? He said, the noise is because these thieves came and I chased them off. Now they had this law of obedience, you know. They, that means in the, in the movement, you have to do what the, what the superior or the person in charge told them. Francis said, you take the food we have, run after them, <laughs> lay, the, lay it on the floor, minister to them till they eat, and then you return. Nobody says what he said, but I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> 
some of the choice language he may have, the holy man may have used in, in his response. But he was under obedience. So he went. And he stopped these people and said, My mo the, uh, the master told me to tell you that you have to have this food and I was instructed to, to serve you till you had your food. That's exactly what happened. They said, did that. But they say, when this man returned, the brother returned, together with him, the three thieves also returned. Because they encountered Christ in this action. Now actually, you look at the flow. Number one, uh, Francis has a divine encounter, a revelation. He passes it on to the brother. But that passing on is not very pleasant. How is that? Because it's obedience. In that obedience, this guy goes through hell. But he grows. Can you see how we how we have to how a community works? That's how a community works. You know, you grow through the struggle of saying yes to God. And when he grew in that, it became a blessing for these three. And actually history, it's a historical thing, this thing what happened. One of those three became the superior of the order in later life. One of those three. Can you imagine the, the call that God had on his life? Which was released when this brother went through the struggle of saying yes. And here is our call tonight. You know, we need others. We need others to know Christ. We need others to grow in Christ <laughs> through our struggles, through our you know being a community, and we need others to build the kingdom of God together. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord!